Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and God bless you. Thank you for making the true choice to be here today. I tell you, God woke me up this morning with a song in my heart and a verse, a, a verse in my mind. He's just so good to us. He's so good to us. I, I want to challenge you to do what I've been trying to do. I really want to seriously challenge you to do what I've been trying to do. And that is, let's not let anything that happened before today get in our way of worshiping this morning. Because you know, nothing that happened up until uh, 10 o'clock can affect the way we worship this morning. Because we're worshiping He who's in control. Yes, Lord. And let's not think about, be worried about, or discouraged about what may happen after the service. Because He may come before the service is over. Amen. But let's really open our hearts and our minds and worship Him in truth and in spirit this morning from the depths of our heart. He is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our, our worship. I was listening to a song this morning called He Never Gave Up On Me. Aren't you glad, church, you can say He Never Gave Up On Me? Amen. One of the lines in that song says, If you saw what I used to be, you would know that He never gave up on me. Yes. I can't tell you about you, but I can tell you about me. If you saw what this fellow used to be, you would know that Jesus never gave up on me. Praise the Lord for that. Let's, let's stand join Brother Brett in a couple of hymns this morning. Turn over to page 92, please. Page 92. This whole talk with Jesus. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in.
if you come, don't wait for the invitation. You come, and if you've got something you want to add to the service that God will lead you in, you do that. Go ahead. I thought that it was a, a bold decision to undertake our construction project in the front during the pandemic. Uh, Can't hear I'll take this off, I'm sorry. Um, boy, I'm, I'm more impressive than ever now. <laughs> he didn't shake. Uh, but my verdict is in here on uh, our uh, church leadership, and I want to share that with you. Now, Pastor Joe's already told you that. Uh, we were able to transform the front and the entrance of our church without having to borrow money or even dig into our reserves. And this is due mostly to your generosity. Yes, yes. I mentioned to Brother Joe yesterday that while our attendance has understandably suffered during the pandemic, our monetary contribu contributions have not. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Thank you. However, you should know that we also benefited from lots of volunteer labor and, in some cases, materials at no cost were contributed. In my experience, it is usually great leadership that inspires people to do that. When we asked Joseph B. Kennedy, Jr. to be our pastor, I did not know him very well. But in my but in my defense, let me ask you a question. Who could have known that an expert in building maintenance, a wise and compassionate person, a devoted man of God, able to adapt to unpredictable changes with sound judgment, and an inspiring preacher, could all be could all be found in one man? Now I'm pretty old. <coughs> And during my life, I've seldom been the boss. I have instead mostly followed the leader. But during that time, I've learned something about leadership. And I have never experienced the qualities of leadership that we have in this church. Thank you, Pastor Joe. And thank you, Sister Marcy.
uh, I'd like for y'all to pray for my children who are still having a very hard time with this. And I, I love you both. I'd like to say I'm, I'm glad I'm in this church. I've always been happy in the church someplace since I was a little girl. But I prayed a prayer because I was at a miserable time in my life. I prayed a prayer even though I was in the church somewhere. I said, please, Lord, whatever's wrong, make it right because I'm not happy anymore. August the 16th, it was on a Thursday. On Friday, I left the nursing home and I ran right into Pastor Joe and Miss Marcy. And I knew there were her walk was the Lord, it was the good one. And then I said, you, are you here? No, I'm an excellent missionary Baptist church now. And as I walked away, the Lord said, didn't you pray that yesterday? And I said, I did. And there I was that Sunday. I've been happy ever since. <laughs>
even if you want to just talk or defend. And the answer came back, well, it must have been a half an hour later. And I want everybody to take this to heart, and I want you to really think about it, because this, as I said before, we need faith right now. Every Christian in the United States needs faith and needs prayer. Amen. If God intervenes, which you know He will, things will go correctly. Yes, Lord. But this is what Jim sent back to me and says, thanks for the kind words, Rich. Yes, the faith is still there. Amen. A miracle did happen. Six perfect, glorious months. Here, suffering will soon be over, and she will be with Jesus in the greatest place in the universe. I will never be one of those, why me? Or, why could God do this? How many times have we felt sorry for ourselves? And Ashley said that. Mm -hmm. And here's a man that's losing his four-year-old daughter after thinking that everything is going to be good. He can come out and stay and make those comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he said, why God could do this people? Whether you live four years or 80 years, this life is so short, but eternity with the Lord is forever. Amen. I want to see my, son, my daughter again, if I'm sorry, and ultimately, I want to see my daughter again someday. <laughs> he says, thanks for reaching out and God bless you know, he asked for God to bless me, and, you know, this is something that we really, really need to think about, and we need to start looking at our own faith. Can we have a faith that's this strong? Yes. But we're the ones that have to do it. Uh, imagine what can happen. Imagine what can happen to all God's people who come together in faith, faithfully, and that, that kind of faith. I, I was reading one of my commentaries one time. One of our founding fathers, I think it may have been Benjamin Franklin, but I'm not sure. But one of them said, It remains to be seen what can be accomplished in the heart of a woman or man that will fully put their trust in Jesus Christ. That's what our country is founded upon. And faith will take you a long ways, friends. Faith will take you a long ways. Imagine what can happen. Even in our service this morning, right here, friends, right here, right now, where the rubber meets the road, we're, none of us are promised uh, the next hour, but we're here right now. Imagine what would happen in this service right now if men and women fully put their trust, that kind of trust, in Jesus Christ. Anyone else with something you just need to say? Go ahead, Brother John. You know, this election thing, I didn't get who I voted for. But I don't believe there's ever been an election. God was in control of us. Right. It doesn't matter who you vote for, you've got one vote. And he can make everything work out right. And we, we do need to be for all the people, not just a few. Mm -hmm. If we could get all the people together and get that faith that we're talking about together, we could surely move a mountain. But yes. instead of bringing us receive, we move a mountain. That's right. That's right. I want to pray for everyone. If you didn't get your way in the election, just pray and go on with it. That's right. That's right. That's all you can do. Right. You can hang around being sad about it. If you don't do nothing about it, then you've got to live with it. But if you pray about it and pray that God will take care of it, it might not please you the way he takes care of it, but it'll please him and that ought to please everybody. Amen. Amen. You know, you know, I, I'll tell you, I hope it's the Lord's will to speak on that this morning, if God will allow me. You know the most important vote that was ever cast? Jesus voted for us. He voted for us. That's the most important vote that's ever cast. I'm so glad for that. Anyone else with a testimony before we run to service? Then uh, much we need to be remembered in prayer. Miss Michelle Matheny's mom is hospitalized. You heard last uh, through the one call last week that she 
uh, was diagnosed with COVID as well as her father. The mom continued to get worse symptoms, but she's still in the hospital. And so we want to pray for that, Miss Michelle's family, her mom and her dad and the family. <clears throat> we know that's not easy, but remember them. As far as I know, David Hines is still in the hospital, I believe, down in Toledo. Uh, the cancer he's been dealing with has taken the turn and affected his heart, and he went into AFib. And, um, and I'll tell you how fragile, how fragile life is. I talked to his father-in-law. He said, can you, can you please go visit him? And, and I'm going to do my best because Marcy contacted his wife and we're trying to make plans. His wife said, if, if he gets to come home. And so life is fragile, but we got now. We got today, right here, right now. Amen. And God cast his vote for us. And I want to talk about that this morning. Amen. And so, friends, if we're here this morning and there's room for us to be thankful for and appreciate God's greatest gift more, I pray he'd help us, each one of us, to do that. If we're here this morning and there's a spiritual need in your life, whatever that may be, I pray you wouldn't put it off. You wouldn't uh, You wouldn't try and uh, suppress that need that you know you have. But wherever we're at this morning, friends, we've got the here and now. And let's take full advantage of it. Pray for this service. Someone else with a special request you'd like to share before we pray? Anybody at all? That's not a lot to say something. I've been quiet way too long. <laughs>
And Lord, may it take charge of the remainder of the service. Lord, may everything that's said and done just be to uplift and glorify you, Lord. And may you just uh, meet with us, Lord. Bless the singing, Lord. Bless the uh, preaching of your word. And just prepare our hearts to receive it and to respond, Lord, to the uh, Holy Spirit's leadership. Lord, we ask God, Jesus, most precious and holy name. Amen.
here, but I try to come see the game with this. This is such a blessing because when you sing and breathe it, this is going to help me. So, put it in. CD for me next, okay? <laughs>
here today. He really burdened me the last couple of months about kneeling when I'm in the house of the Lord. And I know that you can kneel and pray anywhere. But look around you. There are people and there are places that don't have that luxury, that that freedom has been removed from them. And so every time I'm on my way to church, I just can't wait to be able to kneel in this holy place and thank the Lord for all of his blessings. And I want to encourage you as Christians to take advantage of the opportunity. No one's going to think less of you for kneeling in the house of the Lord, for going to the altar. God wants us to do that. Today I feel so emotional and thankful that I feel like I could stay all morning at that altar thanking Him for all of His blessings. They're so numerous, I can't begin to count them. And so I encourage you, if you're here, under the sound of the voice that the Lord is sending out through the music and through the message this morning, take heart and let the Lord lead you. Take heart, let the Lord lead you. Well said, well said. And so, <clears throat> I'm going to try my best, I guess I said this morning earlier, to leave uh, politics, elections, and all that stuff behind me. I'm not worried one bit uh, about what the future holds, because I know the world's a future. Amen, amen. And so I want to stick to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, his righteousness. Amen. And all these things will be added. Amen. Tell me yes. what all these things does not include, Brother Kirk. That's a pretty right amen. spot, isn't it? Yeah, amen. Yes, and so I, that's what I'm trusting in this morning. Yes. And I, I hope that you are as well. If you want to turn your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, you find your place, please stand with me, we'll, look, we'll, we'll start at verse 23. <clears throat> you bear with me, I've got to read about nine, nine verses to get to the one I, the one I try to speak about. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. So this talks about, this isn't the focus of my message, but it talks about, uh, friends, the way we ought to be every day, especially now moving, moving forward. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put in the way lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now I had to read all those because you need some context so I can get to verse 32, which is what I want to speak about. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. And listen, friends, if there's never another verse that you commit to your memory the rest of your life, remember this. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Brother Joe, would you please ask God's blessing on the remainder of the service this morning? Father, thank you so much for this day. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house again. And to feel your presence in our hearts, God, and in our midst. And, and to see my brothers and sisters encouraged. And, and to see them happy to be here, Lord. And, and happy to, to have experienced the renewing power of your Holy Spirit. God, I would ask that you please bless Brother Joe as he brings the message today. Thank you for what you've laid on his heart. And may we uh, pay close attention and, and take it and, and find a piece of what he says from you, Lord, to, to apply to our lives so that we can have a renewing of our mind and our spirit, God, 
Because we know it doesn't matter what politician is in the house, Father. If your people do not follow you, if your people do not experience a renewal in their heart, it won't matter who's leading our country, God. Please bless us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we get a real good lesson on how we ought to always conduct ourselves as children of God right here. Mark those down, we read those 23 through 31, because uh, they're very helpful. And he tells them there in verse 32, be you kind one to another, tender hearted. Boy, if kindness and tender heartedness characterize our world going forward, we wouldn't have to worry about very much. Uh, and then you know you know where real kindness and tender heartedness comes from? From God. It comes from God. You may think that you're kind, you may think that you're tender hearted. But until your black heart has been washed in his red blood mm -hmm. and turned white in the snow, you don't really understand what being tender hearted is. You, you don't. Work. You, you can think you do, but you really don't. Until you've experienced it, you can't begin to understand what it's like. And then he says, uh, forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And that's what I want to look at how that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And you know, I don't often put a uh, title on a message, but if I were to do that this morning, surely, surely it would be God cast his vote for us. And, and this tells us, Brother Jerry, this tells us plainly, God cast his vote for, his vote for us. Mm -hmm. uh, to get the full measure of the impact uh, and the uh, profoundness of this simple little phrase, we need to look at a couple of things. Uh, we need to look at uh, why we need forgiveness, friends. It says that. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. And why do we need forgiveness? Because God hates sin. And, and you know what? The world, and this is where the world besmirches the church and, and says, uh, explains it wrong, Brother John. Uh, God hates sin. Make no mistake about that. He hates anything to do with sin. Anything that's sinful at all, He hates it. But He doesn't hate sinners. He doesn't hate sin. He hates our actions. He hates our choices. He hates the things we do in our life that amount to sin, which is disobedience, uh, being disobedient. He hates that. Amen. But he doesn't hate you if you're sin. He doesn't hate you if you've never accepted him. He doesn't hate you no matter how many times you walk out the door not having accepted the greatest of all gifts, and that was me. He doesn't hate us. Aren't you glad for that, Brother Joey? That thrills my heart, Brother Jerry. Uh, that, that makes me so happy to know that uh, although uh, in my lifetime I've allowed sin to reign over my life uh, far too many years and days gone by, even when I was in the midst of that way of living and acting and behaving, uh, God didn't hate me. He doesn't hate you. Psalms 26 and 5 uh, tells us this about, uh, about that. It says, I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. God, God, uh, uh, God hates sin. He Amen. hates sin. And that's important for us to know. And so uh, let's look at some other reasons about this uh, simple little thought. Christ has forgiven us. And God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. It's, uh, look at it, why else God hates sin. You know why else? It's because sin, being sinful, is, is the antithesis or the polar opposite of what God is. God is Amen. holy. Amen. God is holy. Yes, God is sinless. <laughs> He's blameless. He, he, is, he is the very nature of all that is good and right. That is God. Psalm says it really well this way. It says in Psalms 5 and 4, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Friends, you can look God from top to bottom, from eternity to beginning to eternity's end, and you'll never find a situation where God delves in sin. God, that's just not God. That's not who that He is. That's the greatest characteristic in nature about God. He is not sinful, never has been sinful, never will be sinful, never could be sinful. That's not God. Listen to what uh, Psalms 145 and 17 says. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy and all his works. And see, boy, that, that's, that means everything to us. If he wasn't righteous in all his ways, if he wasn't holy in all his works, the plan of salvation would never ever have meant, amount to anything, anything. And if you want to flip on, uh, go to Isaiah chapter 6. Too many verses for me to type up in my cheat sheet here, so I'm just going to go over and read it to you. 
Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to read you the first five verses there. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So, he saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he, covered, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Do you remember that Christmas play we did, Miss Marcy? Uh, and that was the theme of the Christmas uh, over to Belleville Church. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Uh, and that's what the seraphims, that's what the angels said uh, when they were in his presence. Not to just say it, friends. It says they cried, holy, holy, holy. And friends, I don't know what it would be like to stand in the presence of an all-powerful, uh, sinless, spotless God, but I don't imagine there's much else for the day that you could say except, Holy, 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 Amen. when you stand in the presence of the Almighty. And then it says in verse 4, And the, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. You see, the temple shook. The temple shook. And verse 5 says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Boy, I don't know that Isaiah could have said it much better. Woe is when you stand in the presence of the Almighty, you realize, uh, and you stand in the presence of He that is, that is uh, ultra clean, that is ultra holy, that is uh, beyond what man could even aspire to be, all you can say is, holy, holy, holy. And he says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And you see, when you stand in the presence of God, and you weigh your holiness, your righteousness, if you will, against what God has uh, on His throne, all you can say is, woe unto me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I stand amidst a nation of unclean people. God is holy. And because of that, because of that, he hates sin. And because he hates sin, we need forgiveness. You know why else that he hates sin? Because sin separates. Amen. Sin separates. Amen. Uh, isn't it a sad thing when you look at the lives of people uh, over time, how it seems like the newer generations get a little bit further away from God, you see less of them in church, and, and that's a sad thing. And you see, have you ever seen a family that sin separated it? Have you ever seen that? It's sad. It's so sad. Have you ever seen a relationship that's been broken up because of sin? Amen. It's so sad. Have you ever seen uh, parents that go in the wrong direction uh, and allowed sin into the relationship so they maybe stayed together and you see how it manifested in the lives of the children and grandchildren that come down the pipeline? It's so sad. God hates sin because sin separates. It separates. Isaiah 59 and 2 says it this way, But your iniquities have separated you between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Oh, God. Oh, God, though, you do anything, but don't hide your face from me. Don't stop up your ears that you can't hear my cries. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. And Genesis 3 8 gives us a great example of how sin separates. Do you, do you remember how good that Eve and Adam had in the garden? See, God made everything. He made man. He made man ruler over everything. Saul was not good for man to be alone. Thought he'd provide men and help me. Husbands, aren't you glad for your helpmates? Amen. I'm so glad. If you're not, you can come up here and pray with me after church. <laughs> Sin separates. And so he caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. And he took one of his ribs and used that rib of Adam to create the flesh, the DNA that would become eat. And he had to help me. And they had everything, everything, Brother Jimmy, you could possibly want. They had it. They were a perfect couple. They lived in a perfect place that had not been scarred by the elements of sin. They had not been. And in the best part of the day, and this is a simple thing, Miss Marcy, but I just love it. In the best part of the day, it says, in the cool of the day, God would come to them, Brother Lynn, and talk to them. Uh, how special, Brother John. See, they, they didn't know our parents because God had created them. So God was all they ever knew. And how they must look forward every day, Brother Brett, for the cool of the day when 
God will come. Oh, if, if there's some, I'm not trying to equip my mom and dad to God, but oh, if there is some way they could come back to me and Miss Margie and I could talk to them and, and get some counsel from them and apologize for some of the things I've realized I've done over the years uh, that had affected them negatively, I would do that. And I would cherish them coming every day at the best part. That would be that would be the best part of the day, no matter what temperature it was, if they came. And you can only imagine how they look forward to their conversation and walk in the garden with God Amen. every day in the cool of the day. But then it changed. Genesis 3 it says, And he heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Sin separated them. They were no longer, Brother Ryan, uh, uh, ushering out quickly to get to where God could talk to them. They were going to a place where God maybe couldn't see them, Brother David. They were going to a place where God wouldn't know the decisions they made. Sin separates. And it can cause a lot of pain, friends. A lot of pain. So God had every right to hate sin because it's the opposite of Him. He's holy. And He understands. If anyone understands... Can you even begin to, I, I can't begin to imagine it, that we read it in the Bible, we hear about it, we think about it, and we take it all so for granted. Can you imagine, can you imagine what it was like? If it was hard, friends, for Abraham to walk up the mountain with Isaac, can you imagine, Brother Jerry, for a moment, what it would have been like for God uh, to allow his son to step down from heaven's glory and come to earth, Brother? I can't begin to imagine what that would have been like. Sin even separated God the Father from God the Son, didn't it? It really did. Sin separates. You know why else he hates sin? Because sin blinds us from the truth. It does. Sin really blinds us from the truth. You think about what, uh, how the serpent come slithering along, sees Eve, knows probably what she's thinking about. Eve has already been told by God himself, of all the trees in the midst of the garden, you can eat, say, this one tree. But don't eat from this one tree. Because if you eat from this one tree, the tree in the middle of the garden, you shall surely die. And so Satan, I'm paraphrasing, says, well, Eve, this tree looks so good. It's got such, it's got, the grass is so much greener on this side, and this tree is so much better. Why aren't you eating from this tree? Well, she had the right answer, because God said that the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. She didn't want to die. That takes in how holy God is, how the sin separates, and it shows how sin blinds us. She knew the truth. Amen. What did he say? It's very simple, Mr. Wanda. Listen, listen now. The old silver tongue devil. You shall not surely die. She just said, in the day that I eat of this, God told me I shall surely die. And now what's she saying, Miss Allen? The devil told her, you shall not surely die. Well, did she pack up her bags and go home and not eat of the fruit? No. She was blinded. She was blinded. And oh, the world is so blinded today. People making up their own way to get to heaven. People making up their own path to salvation. Amen. And if you get away from this path, you're wrong. You've been blinded. Your eyes have been blinded. Yeah. This, this right here outlines the way. Romans 10, 9, and 10 will always be the only way to God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man will ever make it to the Father short of death. Amen. Amen. Sin separates and it blinds us to the truth. John says it this way in 1 John 2 and 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth. Because darkness, darkness has blinded his eyes. It blinds our eyes. I'm wrapping up. I'm getting there. God hates sin, not only because it blinds us to the truth. And again, it's so sad, the number of people that are falling for all these other things, all these other ways, all these other paths. Some of the most outlandish things you can think of, people are thinking that gives them the path to eternity. It couldn't be further from the truth. But God uh, has every right to hate sin because He understands it holds dire consequences. Dire. Pastor Joe, what's dire? Bad. The opposite of good. As far away from good and pleasant as you can get, Brother Brett, that's where dire is. Sin brings with it dire consequences. We know that Romans 6 and 23 tells us the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. That's what makes the gift of God so wonderful. The wages. Listen to what Revelation 20 and 15 says. You want to you wanna, uh, speed read and jump to the end of the book? Read these verses. Revelation 20 and 15. 
And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast. How do you get your names written in the book of life? Accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Believe. The Bible says it's about. Do you, can you believe that God is that Jesus is the Son of God? Can you believe that He was virgin born? Can you believe He lived a sinless, spotless, thirty-three plus years uh, 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 vicariously for us? Can you believe that? Can you believe He uh, He, he could have called the whole uh, uh, twelve legions of angels if He wanted to, but He didn't? Can you believe he died on the cross, he rose again, now ascended to the Father's right hand? Can you believe that? Believe, can you believe that? If you can, the wages of sin don't have to be death because you can experience the gift of God, which is eternal life from you in Christ. Listen to what it says in Revelation 21 and 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Eternity. Eternity. Oh, Pastor, why do you get up and come to church every Sunday? We don't want no one to face that. We don't want to. Why do you get up and come? Why, why do you pray all week long? Uh, why do the singers sing? And when people are inspired, to, why do they testify? Because God hates sin. And sin has dire consequences for you. I mean dire consequences. Sin will always, I, 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 how many times have I said this? You can't not say it. Sin will always take you further than you wanted to go. Sin will always cost you more than you're able to pay. Amen. It will, friends. And friends, in eternity, it will surely take you to a place where you don't want to go. So the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars should have their part from the fire. Which burned the brimstone, which is a second. Well, Pastor Joe, I'm okay. I'm not done any of those things. Have you believed? Have you believed? Well, I believe there's a God. No, have you believed? Mm -hmm. You see, if you believe enough, you'll come and give your heart to the Lord. You will. Mm -hmm. Because your, your uh, actions speak to the depth of your belief. And if you have enough faith, you will follow up on your belief with actions. We're not saved by our works, but because we're saved, you're going to have works. And if you believe, one of the works you'll have is coming to Jesus. The open profession of your faith. So that God has every right to hate sin. He does hate sin because He's holy, because sin separates, because it blinds us from the truth, and because it carries dire consequences. Now, if you want to go back to uh, Isaiah chapter 53 with me, I want to, because this talks about how the God chose us. He cast His vote for us. Isaiah 53. And then the musicians, you can come back. And Brother Dave, if you can get that song ready for us, you can go for him. That'd be great for him. Isaiah 53, verse 5. I'm going to start reading. Remember, I just said back there that verse 32 of Ephesians chapter 4 finishes with God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven. Even though God hates sin, and all these things I shared about sin, and, and if we've never believed and, and, and we've never demonstrated our belief by coming to accept Him, God's not pleased about that. But, but, but God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. And this explains it right here. This explains how and why that happened. Verse 5, chapter 52. It says, But He, speaking of Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. See, Jesus suffered, and His suffering, because He was a sinless, spotless Lamb of God, Allow us to find forgiveness. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Think about that. No one's ever been chastised more than Jesus. And that's how we find spiritual peace, is because of the chastisement that he did. And now that we find spiritual peace, we find spiritual healing because of the stripes of his mercy that he was given. His flesh was laid over, friends, so you and I might know spiritual peace. Verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. If everyone turned uh, to his own way, the Lord hath laid on him who Jesus the iniquity of. See, everyone's trying a different way. Everyone's finding a different path. Everyone's coming up with these different things, uh, different ministries, different doctrines. But there's only one gospel, friends. And the Bible, uh, the Bible brings it all together right here for us. The Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. 
Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. Can you imagine all the things, Brother Jerry, that Jesus could have said, or wanted to say, Brother Rich, was just right at the tip of his tongue and saying uh, how un un guilty he was of all these things he accused him of. But instead it says, as a sheep was brought before the shears, he never opened his mouth. Me. Verse 8 says, He was taken from prison, from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he is cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. He was cut off from the land of the living. That's a, that's a long way to say, He died for you. He died for me. Verse 9 says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. He who had never sinned, he who had never one time failed the test, made his bed, his deathbed, with those who had. Verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put into grief. But thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his land. Now listen to verse 11 as we close. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall many righteous servants justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So you see, God has every right to hate sin, and he does. He does. Uh, hey friend, to make no mistake about it, he does. And if you've never accepted Jesus through expressing your belief in who that he is, the Bible says that he is, what he's done, and what he can do for you by coming to receive him, your name is not written in the land of your life. It's not. But it says, He, God, shall see the travail of his soul, Jesus, all that Jesus went through. And looking at Jesus, all that he went through, it says God's satisfied. See, God hates sin. And sin will be punished by great wrath, Mr. Lana. But when God looks at Jesus, and sees the travail of his soul, all that he went through, all that he endured for me and you, Brother John, it says he's satisfied. Amen. When we express our belief in Jesus by coming to him, and he looks at us after we come to him and accept Jesus, he sees us no longer in our sins. He's satisfied. He chose us, Brother Rich. Ephesians 4 and 32 says it so well. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's exactly what verse 11 says. Let's all stand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall many righteous servants justify many. He shall bear their iniquities. When he sees us wrapped in the righteousness of his son, he's satisfied. And his wrath is waived because he's satisfied. God, for Christ's sake, can and will forgive you if you'll come. Remember, God hates sin. He's holy. Sin separates. It blinds us to the truth. And it carries dire consequences. And I've done a terrible job of trying to show you how dire they are. Dire consequences. But you don't have to experience that because Isaiah 53, 11. If you're here this morning and you know not, you know not the Lord, I pray that you would come. I pray you'd understand how much God loves you. I pray you'd understand just how bad that sin is. And you'd express your belief through simply coming forward and allowing us to pray with you and share God's word with you as they sing. Church, pray. Pray hard this morning. Once 